Hi everyone and welcome once again. You're watching Eagle News. I'm Ralph Cornell in Washington. It's Saturday, March 9th, 2024, here in the nation's capital. The week's recap begins with President Biden delivering what is described as a very fiery State of the Union address, something many say his campaign needs. As U.S. President Joe Biden makes his way to the podium for the State of the Union address, chants of four more years from his supporters fill the Congress chamber. Not all, however, are there to applaud the president. As he walks past lawmakers, Biden comes face to face with Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene. Greene is dressed in a Make America Great Again attire, a model used by Donald Trump loyalists. As Greene has done before, she heckles the president during the address. At the start of the speech, Biden declares the purpose of his message. Tonight, I come to this same chamber to address the nation. Now, it's we who face an unprecedented moment in the history of the Union. And yes, my purpose tonight is to wake up the Congress and alert the American people that this is no ordinary moment either. Not since President Lincoln and the Civil War have freedom and democracy been under assault at home as they are today. What makes our moment rare is the freedom and democracy are under attack at both at home and overseas at the very same time. He says history is watching, just as history was watching during the January 6th insurrection. Biden speaks of former President Donald Trump, but never by name. He only refers to him as my predecessor. My predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. I will not do that. This is the moment to speak the truth and to bury the lies. Here's the simple truth. You can't love your country only when you win. Biden also speaks on the Ukraine-Russia conflict, China, reproductive health, immigration, crime, education, health care, and the economy. He also addresses his age, an issue that concerns many voters. The U.S. has announced that it will be setting up a temporary military port in Gaza, this to allow access for more aid to get into the starving territory by sea. Hassan Fergata has the details. In his State of the Union speech, President Joe Biden announces that he has directed the U.S. military to undertake an emergency mission to establish a port in Gaza. Senior administration officials say the move will not involve any U.S. boots on the ground in Gaza, as military personnel will stay offshore while other allies are involved. Another official says the U.S. is not waiting on the Israelis. This, the official says, is a moment for American leadership. Frustration is growing in the White House with Israel's failure to allow more relief into the territory. The official adds that the port, the main feature of which is a temporary pier, will provide the capacity for hundreds of additional truckloads of assistance each day. U.S. officials say it would take a number of weeks until the significant capability was able to bring more aid to desperate Gazans. The aid will come via a maritime corridor bringing aid by sea from the port of Lacarna on the Mediterranean island of Cyprus. Chris Han Fergata, Washington, D.C., Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Meanwhile, voters in 16 states and the territory of American Samoa cast their ballots in the presidential primaries on Super Tuesday. Jeff Sanidad reports. Republicans hold primaries in the American states of Alabama, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, Vermont, and Virginia, and their caucuses in Alaska and Utah. On the other hand, Democrats hold primaries in the same states plus Utah and their caucuses in the U.S. territory of American Samoa. This year's primaries have been described as anticlimactic. It is still, however, anticipated to give a glimpse of where each party is at as the general election in November nears. Many Republicans casting their vote on Super Tuesday, hope Donald Trump will clinch the nomination. I would love to see it be the end. I wish it was November already. I want Trump back. I would like, I would like to see things restored in America. For Democrats like Bill Johnson of Virginia, heading to the polls is his chance to vote away who he thinks is astounding to even be in the race. Uh, it's it's scary. 
The fact that Trump could even be in contention is scary. He's talking about being a dictator. He's talking about ex uh, wholesale deportation of people just because of their race or their religion. That he's even a candidate, I find astounding. I really do. The Republican candidate needs 1,215 delegates out of 2,429 to win the nomination. Donald Trump leads by 906 votes ahead of Nikki Haley. In response to this, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley has announced that she suspending her bid for the Republican presidential nomination. The Democrat candidate, meanwhile, needs 1,968 delegates to win. That is out of 3,934 total delegates. President Joe Biden has swept the Democratic race. In Washington, D.C., Jeff Sanidad, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. In related news, Democratic President Joe Biden and former Republican President Donald Trump both win big on Super Tuesday's presidential primaries. Our teams across the country ask voters what they think about the more than likely repeat of the two men's bid to hold the nation's top office. Jeff Sanidad has the story. This false U.S. presidential election is shaping up to be a rematch between President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump. And that has a lot of voters concerned because despite party allegiances, many don't like either candidate. In assembling of voters in several states, the opinions ran the gamut. Texan Lena Kelly is a hardcore Trump supporter. USA need, uh, needs a strong leader and brave man. And that's him. Chris from Las Vegas is also on Team Trump, saying he's happy the former president is the likely Republican nominee. I think it's wonderful because I love Trump and I think he'd be great for the uh, economy and for the United States. His campaign's about everything, so everything that Biden's done, he's going to do the opposite. John Thompson of Georgia echoes that. We need a guy like Trump to come and help us out. One continuing theme is that many voters like Irene Irby from Maryland aren't impressed with either candidate. I feel the two of them are too old to be trying to run this country. They can be a much better candidate outside of those two. Clifton Pope says it comes down to choosing who is going to do the least damage. But honestly, it's like picking the lesser of two devils. It's like, which one would you rather be cool with? Because they both have tremendous flaws, but at the same time, both of them have some benefits to them. Charles is saying his law says he has no preference either way. It doesn't make any difference because my concern is, as long as the government being uh, treated right and the people being treated right, so it doesn't matter. For others, they hope whoever moves into the White House next year will address issues dear to their hearts. In the case of nurse Raquel Kayabiab, it's health care. There are a lot of health care workers that really don't have the uh, access to the affordable uh, medical or health care that they need. School teacher Mary Negrillo is hoping the winner will remember the nation's classrooms. Give help to improve the educational system of our country and also give better compensation for teachers. Michelle Jefferson says the economy and immigration are the big issues. I think the outcome will come down to voters not tied to any political party. I think independent and moderate voters will come out and um, possibly do some surprises come November. Americans select their president indirectly through a complicated system that involves the Electoral College. That means winning the popular vote doesn't necessarily mean winning the keys to the White House. The key to this election is who will woo the most independent, non-aligned voters, especially in the swing states where there are enough Electoral College votes to push a candidate over the finish line. At the U.S. Capitol here in Washington, D.C., Jeff Sanidad, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. In other news, Facebook, Instagram, and Threads users worldwide suddenly find themselves unable to log onto their social media accounts on Tuesday. This as Meta suffers a highly unusual outage of its social media platforms. Vassal Feria tells us more. At around 10 o'clock Eastern Time Tuesday morning, 
Meta users found themselves logged out of their social media accounts. Many tried to log back in with their correct usernames and passwords, but found themselves receiving error messages from the company. Meta spokesman Andy Stone posted on X admitting the social media giant was experiencing technical issues. The sites returned to normal about two hours after the outage reports first emerged. Stone says the issue is resolved. He apologizes for any inconvenience. According to the Down Detector website, reports that Facebook was down peaked at around 500,000 at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Instagram peaked at about 70,000 reports at the same time. Threads, the rival of Twitter, also suffered reports of outages. Meta's messaging service WhatsApp, however, seemed to be spared. Facebook is the world's largest social media platform with 3 billion active monthly users. According to the latest data, Instagram has about 1.35 billion users. X saw a spike in online activity as users were locked out on the Meta sites. U.S. media focused on the fact that the outage took place on Super Tuesday, the day that millions of people were voting in primaries in 15 states and one territory. Roselle Feria, Washington, D.C. Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Extraordinary stories from Thomas I. Likeness today. From the London Underground calling on musicians, to a team of women protecting Mount Kilimanjaro, to the last Venezuelan glacier melting away. All these and more on Correspondent at Large. And now news and commentary from around the globe. Well, it's good to be back after a month's vacation. We spent 30 days in the Philippines, but I've got to admit, I've, I've missed sitting here in front of the camera talking with you. Are you thinking about perhaps a career change? Well, here's something different. You'll have to go to London, England, though. The London Underground, that's that city's subway system, London Underground is looking for buskers. Spokesman Patrick Doig says initially about 450 musicians have applied. And we'll whittle that down to around about 240 applicants that will be performing live in front of our judges. They've got 10 minutes to impress those judges and to try and secure a license. Now buskers have been entertaining commuters for the past 20 years. And the audience is big. You know, about three and a half million people use the London Underground every day. They call themselves Team Lioness. These women patrol the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro in the African nation of Kenya. Their mission? To protect wildlife and tackle poachers. But for many of them on the team, like Purity Lakera, it's also an opportunity to break age-old prejudices. My community believes that a woman cannot do a physical demanding job. My community believes that women are always a uh, Maybe weak, that's what they think, they think so, but it's not true. The 17 women are not part of the government-run Kenya Wildlife Service. The International Fund for Animal Welfare created Team Lioness, and it pays the rangers' salaries. Climate change is taking its toll on glaciers worldwide. These beds of ice high atop mountain peaks are the source of water for rivers. But they're shrinking as global temperatures rise and less snow falls. In Kyrgyzstan, farmers are creating artificial glaciers like these. For two weeks during autumn, they redirect water from the mountain peaks where it freezes and can be used as a source of water for the region during other times of the year. Meanwhile, in Venezuela, the government there is trying to save what's left of the country's last glacier. You see it here on the screen. It's just a small patch of ice among all of this bare rock. Now the government is using geothermal blankets to try to restore the glacier, but experts say, no, that's not gonna work. It's too little, too late. In Birmingham, England, the hunt is on for the top dog. Thousands of canines and their owners are taking part in the Crufts Dog Show this weekend. More than 200 breeds from all over Europe are taking part. 
The coveted Best in Show starts with each breed picking its own winner. They then compete to win one of seven groups. Those Best in Group winners go on to compete for Best in Show, and that's regarded by dog breeders to be the best in the world. And you know, while the owners take this very, very seriously, I think the hounds just kind of view it as a day out. I'll be back in seven days, and in the meantime, I wish you all peace, joy, and happiness in the ensuing week. Thomas I. Likeness, correspondent at large, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. In Canada, health officials on Ontario province sound the alarm of a possible measles outbreak. Yolanda Espiras reports on health as well. There is warning of a potential measles outbreak here in the province of Ontario. As Public Health Ontario reports, at least five confirmed cases of measles so far. Spread through coughing and sneezing, measles is a highly contagious virus that can stay up to two hours in the air. Fever, rash, coughs, runny nose, red watery eyes, sensitivity to light and white spots around the mouth are some of the symptoms of measles. Endemic measles or regularly occurring measles in a region has been eliminated in Canada. However, recently, imported cases of measles have occurred in the province. Last month, Peel Public Health reported and confirmed a measles case with a child who recently traveled abroad. This week, York Region's Medical Officer of Health has reported that a man in his 30s infected with measles had close contact with a high school, exposing 1,500 students and 150 staff members to the virus. Those exposed have been encouraged to take the measles vaccine. According to Public Health Agency of Canada, most measles outbreaks in Canada are the result of returning travelers who were infected abroad. Yolanda Aspiras, Toronto, Ontario, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Papua New Guinea Prime Minister James Marape welcomes the historic reopening of the International Monetary Fund, or IMF's, resident office in Port Moresby after 20 years of absence. Here's Echo Ortelesa Kinyola on Oceania at a glance. IMF's Deputy Managing Director Bo Lee and Prime Minister James Marape underscore the value of multilateral partnerships. This office will serve as a hub for collaboration, providing support and assistance to the authorities as they navigate an increasingly complex global environment. Working hand in hand, we can support you as you address challenges and seize opportunities. Marape invites the IMF to re-establish its office in Papua New Guinea to ensure a transparent and accountable assessment of the country's economic policies and performance. Uh, Papua New Guinea is privileged to have almost all the multilaterals globally recognized multilaterals in our country now with IMF coming back fully with a functional office open is symbolic to the presence of IMF and IMF in a greater scale is the global benchmark of the economy. With the return of IMF, Papua New Guinea's economy is anticipated to stabilize. From Port Morrisby, Papua New Guinea, Eko Hortaleza Quinola, Eagle News, we live in extraordinary times. The United Nations Food and Farming Agency reports that heat waves and floods inflict greater economic pain on rural women than men. The UN says climate change is intensifying these existing inequalities. Ashley Sackmar has more on Down to Earth. Scientists say the impact of rising temperatures is already hitting the poorest and most vulnerable people on the planet. In a new report, the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, or FAO, warns that failure to address the unequal impacts of climate change on rural people will intensify the already large gap between the haves and have-nots and between men and women. 
The report shows that when disaster strikes, rural women-led households in low- and middle-income nations face more financial burdens than men. The FAO says if these notable existing differences in wages are not addressed, the gap will only worsen. She's working harder, she's working longer, she's doing an extra hour of work a day compared to a male farmer in order to try to adapt to climate change. But the truth is that without the access to those kinds of assets and technologies, she just may not be able to keep up with the changing climate. For all of these reasons, climate change is having a disproportionate impact on women and female-headed households. It estimates that if average temperatures increase one degree Celsius, women would face a 34% greater loss in total income compared to men. The agency adds that women are more vulnerable to changes in the climate than men. This, the report states, is because of deep-rooted social structures and discriminatory norms and institutions. That leaves women bearing a much larger domestic and child care burden than men, limiting their opportunities to study and find a job. It also makes it more difficult for women to migrate or make money from non-farming activities when climate change affects crops. Ashley Sackmar, Toronto, Ontario, Eagle News. We live in extraordinary times. Before we let you go, here's our photo of the week. Enjoy this beautiful photo of Shipwreck Beach in Poipo, Kauai, Hawaii. Thank you so much, Eric Sinjarvina, for sharing your stargazing experience with our viewers. Thank you all for joining us again. If there are any stories or topics you want us to share with you, just comment below. Follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and X at Eagle News Live. I'm Ralph Cornell. We live in extraordinary times. Stay happy and healthy, everyone.